after the destruction of the earth, God calls Noah, a righteous man whom he saves in all of his family and makes an agreement with him. And he lays out the terms of the agreement, but he tells him, I'm going to give you a sign, a token of this agreement. In this lesson, we will find out what is this agreement. Join me as we talk about the rainbow. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sunday School lesson that's taught by Rodney Jones. Do me a favor, hit that subscribe button below and there's a bell symbol right beside it that will notify you each and every week that we upload our videos. I would like to thank you all for viewing and for taking time to comment and please leave me a brief comment if you will and if you wish to be so kind. Sunday school superintendents, Sunday school teachers, and just Bible lovers. Awesome lesson here. It's a very short lesson uh, because it deals with basically the terms of the agreement that God has with Noah. We're in Genesis, the 8th chapter, verses 20 through 22, and the 9th chapter, verses 8 through 17. Our subject for discussion is the rainbow. The rainbow and our key verse comes to us in Genesis 9 verses 11 I'll read the lesson and then we're going to talk about it Genesis 8 20 through 21 and Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar and the Lord smelled a sweet savor the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing or everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and the harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease chapter 9 verses 8 through 17 and God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him saying and I will behold I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth let me put a point there never said anything about the fish in the sea and I will establish my covenant with you neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all earth, or all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. 
And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word for the edification of our souls and the people of God. Said Amen. Two key characters in this lesson. Two key characters. The Lord and Noah. Now if you were to take a moment and look at the spelling of the word Lord, you will find all capital. Capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. Usually when you read the word Lord, it's a capital L and small O-R-D. I said that in a few videos ago. But in this lesson, you find all capitals of the word Lord. That's put there, put there for a specific reason. And actually, the word Lord here is a personal name given to Israel by God, which you will find that later when God deals with Moses and God deals with Abraham. It's different from the other word Lord, which means husband or Lord of the land. But here the word Lord literally is the self-existing one or the self-sufficient. It's the same Lord that says to Moses, I am that I am. I exist because I exist. I am the self-existing one. This is the one that's dealing with uh, Noah in this lesson. Now in this lesson, you will find a covenant that God made with Noah. Now I'm not going to go into deep details about of the covenants, but there is what we call an Adamic covenant, an Edenic, Edenic covenant, an Abrahamic covenant, a Noahic covenant. These are different covenants that God made with man on earth. I believe it's about six or seven covenants. Today I'm just going to deal with uh, the one covenant. Maybe one day we'll do a video on the covenants of God. And then the second person, the second key person is a man by the name of Noah. This Noah, the Bible is unique, says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God got ready to destroy the earth because he could not find righteous men on the earth. And the imagination of, the, of, of man's mind and his heart was evil. And as God prepared to destroy the earth, the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now this Noah was a righteous man in all of his generation. He was the one that found grace in the eyes of, of the Lord. This Noah is the grandson of uh, uh, Methuselah. Methuselah is his grandfather. Lamech is his father. Noah was 600 years old in this lesson. And Noah was, would be in the ark for a little bit over a year, maybe about a year and 17 days or something like that. But Noah was in the ark for over a year. I know it rained 40 days and 40 nights, but the water would be on the earth for a long period of time. And so Noah was in this ark for over a year. Now, also Noah took, so you know, because this is good for the lesson. Noah took, he was instructed by God to take the animals two by two, male and female, and he took seven clean animals and two of unclean animals. So whatever categories of animals he took, seven of them would be clean, while two of them would be unclean. And I believe the purpose of the clean would be so that he can use it for his sacrifices, which we will see later on. And the purpose of him bringing these animals is so that the seed of these animals can remain on the earth. I have eight key words for you or phrases. Eight key words or phrases. Altar, burnt sacrifice, sweet savor, curse, imagination, establish, covenant, and token. Altar, burnt offering, sweet savor, curse, imagination, establish, covenant, and token. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. It's unique to me that the first thing that Noah would do or the first thing we find Noah doing after God saves him from the flood is entering into what I call worship. Later, God would establish uh, sacrifice with the children of Israel as a form of worship. 
he would establish sacrifice with Israel as a form of worship. So sacrifice would be the way that the children of Israel would worship God. Now, in this lesson, this is the first lesson where we find an altar actually being built. We really don't know of any altar prior to uh, Noah building this first altar. The first thing that takes place after God allows Noah to put his feet on the face of the earth is Noah erects an altar. The altar is one of our first uh, key words. In the Hebrew, the word altar means a place of slaughter or uh, sacrifice. A place of slaughter or sacrifice. An altar was a platform or elevated place used for either sacrifice, but it was not always used for sacrifice. Sometimes it was used for a memorial, but uh, it was usually made out of the earth, made out of stone, and later it began to be made out of wood. So it's just an elevated place where it would be used for one of two reasons. Reason number one, it would be used as a sacrifice or a sacrificial system. It would be used to sacrifice the animals on. And then number two, it would be used as a memorial. When you get to Joshua, they had to erect altars so that they can use them for the purpose of memorials. So Noah built an altar unto the Lord. There's that word, that capital all capital L-O-R-D. He built an altar unto the Lord. And then he took of every of. Now notice, it didn't say he took all. It says he took of every clean beast. Now, he didn't use the unclean beast to sacrifice anything to God. Never give anything bad or not your best or something that you don't want or don't desire to God. Always give God your best. Always give God your first. Always give God the fruit of your loins or the fruit of your heart, the fruit of your lips. Always give him the fat of the land, the first fruits of anything you have. He sacrifices the clean, the clean of every beast and of every fowl of the air. Now notice I said earlier that in all of my reading, and you can challenge me on this, but I want you to look into this. I never saw what he did with the fish. Never saw. Because every time I read where he dealt with the animals that were killed or died, he talked about the fowl, he talked about the beast, he talked about the creeping thing, he talked about the cattle, but he used the term on the earth. But I never saw anything about the fish in the sea. That's just a side note. Yet if you want to check that out, uh, go ahead and check it out. Get back with me. <laughs> then. He uh, offered up burnt offerings. Now, later in the, the Bible, burnt offerings is part of the sacrificial system that God would institute with Israel. He would institute burnt offerings with Israel. Today's lesson is the first time that we see of an altar, and it's the first time we see of an actual burnt offering. So in other words, it says that he took the animal whole and he burnt it and he offered it up to God, which I believe it was his form of thanking God and it was his form of worshiping God. This was his way of thanking God for the fact that God had saved them from the flood and then it was his form of worshiping God. Then you get to verse 21, it says, and the Lord smelled, he smelled. God smelled a sweet savor, savor, the word savor is another word for aroma. God smelled a sweet aroma. The Bible even talks about the blood of Jesus being a sweet smelling savor, not sweet smelling savior, but sweet smelling savor. So when it, what it depicts is God accepted the type of sacrifice that Noah offered up to God. That's simply what it means. God accepted the sacrifice and it came to the nostrils of God as a sweet savor, a, a sweet aroma, a sweet fragrance. And what happens is when God smells the sweet aroma or the sweet fragrance, it does something or it did something to the heart of God. It's like an individual being angry and all of a sudden they smell something that's
good to them, it changes your attitude because there is a sweet aroma in the place. There's a sweet smelling and there's a sweet uh, uh, fragrance. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground for man's sake anymore. Curse is another word. Now, in Genesis 3, I believe Genesis 3 and 17, God cursed the ground. This is a different curse. This particular word curse means to pass judgment upon something. Earlier uh, in Genesis probably 3 and 17, God cursed the ground. The ground is still cursed, meaning man will have to work by the sweat of his brow to receive from the earth. The earth would no longer yield its fruit or its vegetable. Prior to sin, Adam will be able to just walk and just pick up something and eat it. But after sin, God cursed the ground because of man. That curse still stands. The curse that he did here is when he destroyed the earth because of man. So God says that he would never pass judgment or curse the ground for man's sake anymore. And the reason he said that, he says, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Man's imagination, and the word imagination is another key word. The word imagination means a framing or a purpose, thought or thought process. I use the word framing because the word imagination means the framing of the mind, the thought process of the mind. And what the Lord says is man's framing of his mind or the intents of man's heart or the imagination of man's heart or the thought process of man from his youth is evil. Matter of fact, that's why God destroyed the earth because every man was doing what was right in his own eyes and, and man had left God. Now man possessed the nature the sinful nature of Adam. So after Adam committed sin, he passed that sinful nature onto his generation. So even Noah still had a sin nature, but the Bible says that Noah was the, the, the righteous man in his generation. So man's imagination or his thought pattern, or his thought process or the purpose in his heart from his youth up is only sinful. So, but God says something here. He says, now, I'm not going to smite anymore every living thing as I have done. Now, God smote everything. He destroyed everything on the earth because of the sin of man. But God says, from this point on, I'm not going to destroy the earth because of man's sin. Now, verse 22, he says, while the earth remaineth. Now, this is key and this is important. He says, while the earth remains. So whatever he's about to say in this verse has nothing to do with eternity, but it has everything to do with while the earth remains. In this present condition is what he's referring to. While the earth remaineth, something is going to take place that will always take place year round. There will be seasons that God has established. And these seasons, as long as the earth is residing, these seasons will always be. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, which means there will be a time to plant and there will be a time to reap that which was planted. Then he mentions cold and heat. Now, I believe the purpose, one of the purposes of the cold, the frost and all that, is to rid the earth of all of the, a lot of the germs and, and things that the earth experiences. It freezes it and it, it, gets, it gets rid of it. If we didn't have cold, this earth would really be messed up. If we did not have coldness, winter and frost and old man winter as we call it this earth would be messed up so he says while the earth remain a seed time and harvest cold and heat summer and winter and day and night shall not cease the earth is going to move on god is not going to destroy the earth by water he's not going to pass a judgment on this earth because of man and the reason why he says because man is sinful from his youth all the way up his imagination, his thought patterns, his thought process is sinful and continual sinful. So God is going to change some things. God is going to 
deal with man from a different standpoint. God is going to send his son in the near future to change the course of man. He's going to change the heart of man. That's a powerful God. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Now he says, I establish. Establish is another key word. Now the word establish means to arise, to erect, or to set forth, to set up, to institute, or to constitute something. God says, I'm going to institute a covenant. I'm going to set up a covenant agreement with you. I'm going to erect one. I'm going to establish. I'm going to found a covenant with you. Now, the word covenant, a covenant is an agreement between two or more parties to perform some action. Say that again. A covenant is an agreement between two or more parties to perform some action. Now, there's a difference between a covenant and a contract. A contract is an agreement between two or more parties for a service or something, but it's, it, it protects both parties in the event one party does not meet the agreement. The contract, it protects one party against another party, but a covenant binds the two co uh, parties together in a relationship. So God says, I'm not about to establish an agreement with you that will protect me from you. He says, I'm going to establish an agreement between you and the earth that will bind you and I together in a relationship with consequences or keeping or breaking the agreement. Say it again, with consequences of keeping or breaking the agreement. So God says, I'm going to literally establish an agreement. I'm going to set forth a binding contract, which is going to cause you and I to be in a relationship or to be in an agreement. We're going to be bound by this agreement, which is unique because usually in a covenant or in an agreement, both parties is included, but both parties has to do something in the agreement. Party number one says, I will do this, and party number two says, I will do this. Now, side note, that's what we call a cutting of the covenant, a cutting of the covenant, which means when two parties cut an animal in half, split the animal in half, and they walk through the animal and they make a covenant. And then they say, if I break this covenant, may what we did to this animal be done to us. <laughs> so the only way to break it is you got to split this person in half. God is saying, I'm going to establish the covenant, I'm going to keep the covenant, and I'm going to bind myself and you in this covenant, but you won't have nothing to do. I'll say that again. God just set up a covenant with this earth and told the earth, I'm going to enter into an agreement, I'm going to establish an agreement, I'm going to include you in it, but I'm going to do all the work myself. You won't have to do nothing in this agreement. Lord have mercy. Then he says, I'm going to show you a token. I'm going to give you a token. Now an agreement, or a covenant is an agreement. In most agreements, there is a seal, there is a covenant. There is a sign, all right? Here, he uses the word token. A token is a sign, is another key word. A token is a sign, it is a signal, it is a mark, it is an emblem. This seal, this emblem, this sign, or this token uh, is a seal of the agreement. So he says, uh, I'm going to establish this between me and your seed after you. That includes us. 
with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of the beasts of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Then it says, and I will establish my covenant with you. And here's the, the parts of the covenant. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. So part one is all of the flesh will not be cut off because of the flood. And part two is there won't be no more flood to destroy the earth. Part one, all flesh will not be cut off anymore by a flood. And number two, there won't be no more flood to destroy the earth. Now, uh, too often we say God says he's not going to destroy the earth by water, but by fire next time. In this lesson, God doesn't mention fire. Peter mentions fire later. But in this lesson, God never said anything about fire. Those are two different uh, scriptures, one Old Testament and one New Testament. In this lesson, God only deals with this covenant that he makes with the earth. Key thing, he makes this covenant with Noah, his sons, the animals, and with the earth. So we're all included in this covenant that God says. Verse 12, he says, and God said, now, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Now, we already dealt with the word token, but the word perpetual generations, the word perpetual means forever. Now, key thing, this forever, he says, if you go back to chapter 8, he says, while the earth remaineth. This word perpetual has to line up with the lesson. So this covenant will be forever as long as the earth remains. Once the earth is destroyed, once the earth leaves, this covenant is gone with the earth. So this word perpetual, which means forever generation, is only set forth as long as the earth remaineth. 13, he says, and I do set my bow in the cloud. Now, there's no scripture that says that God created a bow to place it in the cloud for this purpose. All he says was, I'm going to set my bow in the cloud. Most likely, the bow already existed because God created everything. If I can use Genesis, the first chapter, that he didn't make anything after that. I know it deals with things on the earth, but I'm just putting it out there. I don't think that he created a bow, or as we call it, a rainbow, as a covenant. I think the bow had already been created. And God says in verse 13 that I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Notice First, he talked about it was the covenant was between God and Noah and his sons. Now God, Noah, his sons, and the animals. Now this uh, covenant is between the earth. And then God says, I'm going to take and place the token. And the token would be a bow. And this bow would be a sign or a seal, a visible sign of of the agreement that God established. Verse 14 says, And it shall come to pass, when I, I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bull shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Now, verse 15 is very interesting because God says, he will remember. Now, the word remember, it's not as if God would forget something, but the word remember literally means to bring it to the forefront, to bring it up again, to mention or 
to bring it up for the purpose of doing something with it. So God does not forget. He can never forget. Everything is always in the presence of God. He knows our beginning to the middle to the end and it's all laid out before God because God is omniscient. God is everywhere. God is all-knowing and God is all-powerful. Those are the three attributes of God. Omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. God is all power, God is everywhere, and God is all-knowing. So he says, I'm going to place this here, uh, verse 15, and I will remember my covenant with, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it. It's interesting because sometimes we cannot see the bow. There are days when we can't see it. But just because we can't see it does not mean it does not exist. And the bow is not really for us to see it. The bow really is for God to see it. Because God says he will place. I'm going to read verse 16 again. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So God says, I'm going to put the bowl, I'm going to set the cloud, then I'm going to set the bowl, then I'm going to remember when I set the bowl and set the cloud, I'm going to remember the covenant that I made with the earth. We can always see it. But God will always see it. And then God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, I want to bring out some things about this bowl or this covenant. Number one, number one, the covenant that God said he would put out, it reminds God, or I'm sorry, the rainbow or the bowl that God puts out, it reminds God of his covenant with us. God said that he would not destroy the animals or man anymore by flood, and he will not destroy the earth by flood also. That's covenant. That's part number one. If, so the, the rainbow, it reminds God of his covenant that he made with us. Number two, it reminds us of God's covenant that he made with us. So the first one, it reminds God of his covenant. So when we see it by us reading the scripture, it reminds us of the covenant that God made with us, that he will no longer destroy us by water. Number three, it reminds us how wicked the world was. How wicked the world was. The world was unrighteous. The world was wicked. And man's mind, his, he, he thought sin. Everything about man was sin and only sin and continually sin. So it reminds us how wicked the world is. Number four, it reminds us what happened to that wicked world. Every time we see the bowl, it reminds, us, it reminds God of his covenant with us. It reminds us of God's covenant with us. It reminds us how wicked the world was. Number four, it reminds us what happened to that wicked world. And number five, it reminds us how angry God was. God was so angry that God destroyed the entire world with water because he was so angry of the sins of mankind. And number six, it reminds us of the great wrath poured out on them because of sin. And then finally, the bow in the sky reminds us what happened or what happens to men who try living without God. I'll give you those seven things. The rainbow. Number one, it reminds God of his covenant with us. Number two, it reminds us of God's covenant with us. Number three, it reminds us how wicked the world was. Number four, it reminds us what happened to the wicked world. Number five, it reminds us how angry God was. Number six, it reminds us of the great wrath poured out on them because of sin. And number seven, 
it reminds us what happened or what happens to men who try living without God. Good lesson, short in its context, but very powerful. The rainbow. God determined that he would not destroy the earth by water anymore. He would not curse the ground because of the sins of man anymore. I need you all to do me a favor though. Somebody got to help me. Sunday school researchers, dig in your Bibles and find out what happened to the fish in the sea. Were they included in the destruction of the earth? Because through our, the lesson through our Genesis, I read where God says the cattle, the beasts, the creeping things, and I read where he said the fowl of the air and man. I read where he says dry land. I read where he says upon the face of the earth, but I never read anything in the destruction where it said anything about the fish in the sea. Even in creation, God mentions the whale, but I don't see anything of the fish in the sea unless I'm overlooking something. Get back with me on that. Find that for me or just research it. And as you go to your classes on this coming Sunday, stress to your class the importance of remembering the covenant that God made with us. And stress to them and let them know that we should not misuse the token, which is the bowl or the rainbow. Let them know that the rainbow is no joke, or the bowl is no joke, and it should not be used for any other sign or token other than the fact that it is a reminder, it is a seal, it is an emblem, it is a visual thing that God has made a covenant with the earth that he will no longer destroy the earth by water. That's it. That's the end of our lesson. That concludes our lesson. Very good lesson. I'm loving this lesson. We're dealing with covenants. Covenants will be the lesson for this couple of weeks. Uh, next week's lesson is God's covenant with Abraham. God's covenant with Abraham. We're in Genesis, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 6 and verses 17 through 21. Uh, another great lesson. See you next week. Do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button below. Give me a comment below and also hit that bell looking emblem so that you'll be notified of all of the videos that's uploaded. And remember the Sunday School slogan, a child saved is a soul saved plus a life. Amen. <laughs>